Good evening and welcome to First Christian Church, Katy. My name is Mike Miller and I am the associate pastor here at FCC Katy, and I would like to welcome you all to Songs of Our Faith, a brief exploration of Disciples' Hymnody. This lecture recital is the final project for my Disciples History and Polity course at Phillips Theological Seminary, where I am in the first semester of my fourth year. I asked if, in lieu of a final paper, I could have a lecture recital since my chosen topic was specific based on the hymnody of the Christian Church, and fortunately, Dr. Barnett graciously allowed that. Tonight we will be taking a look at three different hymns that were originally in the Disciples' Hymnal compiled by Alexander Campbell, Barton Stone, and Walter Scott, and can still be found in our modern Chalice Hymnal today. I think it is safe to say that everybody will probably recognize at least one of these hymns, but I am sure that you know and love all of them as their reach stretches beyond the walls of any church. Hymnody is one of the most moving parts of any church service, and the fact that there are still hymns that we sing that were sung during the birth of our denomination and before the birth of our denomination speaks to the enduring quality of the words. Amazing grace, Christ the Lord is risen today, and hark the herald angels sing, share some very important parts of the Christian journey, the birth, the resurrection, and the grace of Jesus. Now, before we begin with the specifics of each of these three hymns found in the disciples' hymnals, I would like to take some time to talk about what hymns actually are. On the surface, it seems like a very easy question to answer. However, throughout my research, I found that this was one of the most difficult questions that I had come across because there is so much to unpack within hymnody that goes beyond just the words. Of course, many of us think of a hymn as the music that we sing every Sunday at church, and there is some truth to that. However, hymns don't actually have any music. In their most basic form, hymns are simple poems. In his work, Hermeneutics of Hymnody, Scotty Gray writes that hymns communicate biblical and theological truths through poems, language, meter, and rhythm. Hymnody is a form of literature. Gray mentions that after scripture itself, hymns are commonly considered the most basic and familiar form of Christian literature. Perhaps it is because of the familiarity of the words that many cling to the old hymns when they face various trials and tribulations in life. This ties in with what Gray further writes, stating that hymns are born out of personal Christian experience consistent with biblical theology, suited for personal or corporate worship, and intended to be chosen prayerfully and carefully. The selection of hymns for a worship service has always been a struggle for me personally, and each person who is part of the planning team has their own ideas of what the hymns mean and how they move one another. The editor of the 1884 Disciples Hymn Book, James Freeman Clark, writes that hymns are an act of worship directly addressing God. Hymns are not just an afterthought of worship planning. They are one of the few parts in worship service where the entire community is united together in song, worshiping the divine. But even more than that, our hymns tell our history. They tell of where we have been, what we have gone through, where we have struggled, and they can help give us a roadmap of where we are to go next. One of my favorite examples of how a hymn can tell us where we are to go and how we are to act is the one that has the common refrain, and they'll know we are Christians by our love. The modern hymnal is not what our hymnals have always looked like, however. In contemporary hymnals, often there are words printed in between a four-part setting of a hymn tune, but most old church hymnals contained only words with few musical notes for the singer, while other times there were no notes or instructions at all. Using these notes, the song leader would then choose an appropriate tune from a book called a harmony, and then use that tune to lead the congregation in worship. We still have all of these notes written in our modern hymnals as well. 
If you look on the screen, you will see a copy of the notes found in the bottom of our chalice hymnal. This is from page 546, Amazing Grace. You'll see there are four pieces of information that are often overlooked while we sing the hymns. By looking at this information, we can find out the author of the lyrics, the composer or the original source of the music, and we see two things written in all capitals, the tune name, in this case, New Britain, and the letters C-N. Let's take another example from the music of tonight's recital portion and look at page 150 of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. This page gives the information of Charles Wesley, the year the text was thought to be written, that the text has been altered from its original form, and the music was written by Felix Mendelssohn in 1840, later arranged by William H. Cummings in 1856, and the descant was written by Paul Lillestrand. The capital letters on the other side look a little different. The tune name is Mendelssohn, but the meter looks different with 77.77D with refrain. You may be asking why this is important to the history of hymnody, but in the early disciples' hymnals, sometimes there was a tune name given, while other times there was only a group of letters or numbers. These letters and numbers are how the various melodies were chosen. Hymns are categorized by their syllabic structure. These various markings, S, M, C, M, L, M, 6868, 8787D, etc., tell the musician how many syllables are expected in each line. This then gives the song leader a clue about appropriate melodies uh, from a book of familiar tunes. Throughout church history, there have been many things called harmonies, and one of the most common ones still used and studied today is the sacred harp harmony. However, in the chalice hymnal, there is only one tune that comes from that harmony book. There were also various other harmonies, and the other one that is noted on the early disciples' hymnal is the Missouri harmony. These harmonies were often printed with a brief instruction on how to read the music, and were often printed with various shape notes to make the reading easier, and that's where we get the name Shape Note Hymn. The earliest disciples' hymnal I could find uh, information on is Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs, compiled by Alexander Campbell, Walter Scott, and Barton Stone, three men who were the leaders of the Restoration Movement that would later become the Christian Church Disciples of Christ. The name Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs come from the Pauline instruction to teach and admonish one another in Psalms, Hymns, and Spiritual Songs, singing with gratitude in your hearts to the Lord. That comes from Ephesians 5:19. However, it was not a unique name to the disciples' hymnal. Many of the hymns gathered in these books had been previously written. Some were composed by Walter Scott and Alexander Campbell, although none of the hymns are given any author credits in the early forms of the hymnals. Much like our modern hymnal, these earliest hymnals were set up with a specific classification style for the hymns and gave some direction of where they were to take place within the service or during a liturgical calendar. Each of the hymns that have been chosen for the recital portion of tonight's performance have come from the earliest version of the disciples' hymnal that I could find, and these hymns are still also found in our Red Chalice Hymnal and throughout many of the world's hymnals. The rest of this lecture will focus on these specific hymns, as well as give information about their author, the composer, if known, and other interesting information or ties to disciples' history I was able to piece together. During each section, there will be a demonstration of what the hymn could have sounded like in early disciples' church services, as well as the tune that is published in our current hymnal. And for reference, when I refer to the title of the hymn, I am not including the hymn tune. I am speaking about the words and the poetry. The first hymn for tonight is Amazing Grace, which gives us an interesting opportunity to look at the response of an author to the events of his time and how that response is also treated in disciples' history. Disciples were born out of a desire for Christian unity. In the early church, this required them to speak out on certain issues of their time. One of those issues in the early days of the Stone Campbell movement was abolitionism and slavery. 
Like many American churches, there were members on each side of the argument. However, in the early Stone Campbell movement, abolitionists were unfortunately in short supply. Two of the compilers of the hymnal that we are using as our source for tonight, Alexander Campbell and Barton Stone, were eman emancipationists. Emancipationists were people who advocated for the liberation of slaves after they had received an education preparing them for freedom. Although it seems like both Campbell and Stone were abolitionists, they were not against slavery in every form. A biography about Stone written by D. Newell Williams states that in response to a question about slavery being right or wrong according to the New Testament, Stone answers that the slavery they practiced in the United States was wrong. Similarly, Alexander Campbell did not think of slavery as a moral evil. According to A Life of Alexander Campbell by Douglas Foster, Campbell's concern with slavery was that it was a, de a detriment to the advancement of white America. Another leader in the Restoration Movement and a compiler of our hymnal for tonight, Walter Scott, did not believe that the church was responsible to emancipate enslaved persons. It is for this history in the Disciples of Christ Church and the story of Amazing Grace's author that I have chosen it as the first hymn for this evening. Amazing Grace was written by John Newton. This hymn was not included in most of the early versions of Disciples' hymnals. However, the earliest version of the hymnal in which I could find a copy of this was the 1834 edition, about five years after the original edition had been published. I wondered about if this had been a response to a shift in theological views of the hymnal's compilers. However, I was not able to come up with any definitive sources or infor information that led me to believe that Campbell, Scott, and Stone knew of the backstory of Amazing Grace or that they had chosen it for any specific purpose. John Newton worked for a large portion of his life as a slave trader, a life he eventually turned away from. Amazing Grace is thought to have been written between 1760 and 1770, although the words were not published until 1779. Although Newton had turned his life away from the work in the slave trade, he did not speak out as an abolitionist until 1788. The words of this hymn speak of a person who called himself a lost wretch who was eventually found and saved by grace. Newton's mother died when he was seven years old, and he did not have many religious convictions growing up. However, after a stormy evening on the night of March 9, 1748, on a slave ship where he had worked, Newton wrote that the Lord came from on high and delivered me out of deep waters. Newton studied Hebrew and Greek, and eventually applied to become a minister under the Archbishop of York. The original version of the hymn had six verses, and we will now hear a version of Amazing Grace that may have been sung with a melody chosen from the Sacred Harp Harmony. That version sounds a bit different from the tune we know today as New Britain. Although there is not an origin for this specific melody from the Sacred Harp, there are a few different potential sources. The first thought is that it comes from a tune sung by enslaved persons. 
Another hypothesis is that it is a simple folk tune from the Appalachian South in the United States. Although we do not know the origin of the tune, the first, hint, the first time the hymn and the tune New Britain were published together is in William Walker's 1835 version of the Southern Harmony. Since his publication, the hymn Amazing Grace has become synonymous with this specific hymn tune. We will now hear a setting of Amazing Grace to the tune New Britain. I hope you enjoy this. The Stone Campbell movement was not alone in its struggles with the response to slavery and abolitionism in America at the time. The Methodist Church was also in a time of transition and division. Although in contrast to the Stone Campbell movement, the Methodist Book of Discipline included resolutions condemning slavery from the beginning. You may ask why we are talking about Methodist history here, and that is because the next few hymns of the evening were penned by Charles Wesley. Charles Wesley wrote the words to no fewer than 13 hymns in our Red Chalice Hymnal, and there is only one person in our hymnal who has written more of our hymns than Wesley, and that is Brian Wren, who is married to a Methodist pastor. I thought it was interesting just how much of our Chalice Hymnal has been inspired by the Methodist Church and the composers who continue to inspire our Methodist siblings. Since the next two selections will be by an author who, although was not technically a Methodist, inspired many of the teachings of the Methodist Church, I thought we could take a little bit of time and discuss a very brief biography of Charles Wesley. Wesley was born on December 18, 1707 in Lincolnshire, England, and Wesley was the youngest surviving son of Samuel and Susanna Wesley. When Wesley was 21 and studying at Oxford, he went through a spiritual awakening that led to a serious study of the Bible alongside his brother John Wesley. After his conversion, Wesley began writing hymns, and he wrote over 6,000 hymns in his lifetime and has been said to have had the impact on Methodist hymnody that Bach had on Lutheran hymnody, even though Wesley's hymns were primarily written for the Church of England. 
It was also interesting to see how all of this works together when Wesley was considered the Bach of Methodism, but one of the composers that we are going to talk about shortly, who will set the words of Wesley, uh, is the reason that we still hear and talk about Bach's music today. Since Wesley has had a large impact on American Protestant hymnody, it is of no surprise that his work has found its way into disciples' hymnody. Some of the most recognizable hymns from Wesley's work are Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, Rejoice, the Lord is King, and O Four Thousand Tongues to Sing. Samuel Rogel writes that hymnody of Wesley reflect and universalizes the experiences of thousands of believers and souls struggling to believe. Charles Wesley's hymnody was full of theology and doctrine, and it was noted that he did not like when people changed the words of his hymns for any reason. However, this is exactly what happened with one of the most well-known Wesleyan hymns that we still sing today, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. The original words of the first verse read, Hark the Herald, oh sorry. The original words of the first verse read, Hark how all the welkin rings, glory to the King of Kings. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumphs of the skies. Universal nature say, Christ the Lord is born today. A meter note in the collection of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs tells the song leader that the meter is seven, and that's the repeated seven that we see at the bottom of that page. However, this is a bit different than how we know this hymn to go today. I'd like to invite the choir back up. We don't have a choir tonight, so I would like to now play... Um, an example of what this hymn might have sounded like in an early disciples' church meeting. And I would like to see if you can tell what some of the differences are before we sing the version that we know well today. In case you didn't catch it, the original version did not have the refrain at the end of each stanza. Our current hymnal lists the meter of this hymn as 77.77d with a refrain. That means there are seven syllables in each of the four lines, then it is doubled, and a refrain is added onto the end. The refrain at the end of each stanza is, Hark the herald angels sing glory to the newborn king. The melody that we know as Hark the Herald Angels Sing was composed by Felix Mendelssohn and was first performed on June 24, 1840. The tune is taken from the second part of Mendelssohn's Festgesang, Opus 68. The pieced Festgesang is scored for brass and male chorus and is also known as the Gutenberg Cantata since it was written to celebrate Johannes Gutenberg and the invention of movable type. 
One of the funnier things that I encountered while doing the research was the original text that was written for this tune. The part where we would commonly sing the refrain, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, was Gutenberg der Deutsche Mann zündete die Fackel an, which translates to Gutenberg the German Man Lit the Torch. After William Cummings adapted the lyrics to add the refrain at the end, the version that we know of today was born. However, this tune probably would not have pleased Wesley too much. When he wrote the hymn, he had a slower, more solemn melody in mind. That's a bit different from the triumphant melody written by Mendelssohn, surrounded by the two brass orchestras, timpani, and an entire choir. We will now hear this version that we know today. Before we go on to our next hymn, there is another tune that has very, very recently become associated with Hark the Herald Angels Sing. I saw it in a group for organists on Facebook, and I thought that I would share that with you, um, because it's a very unusual hymn. You might recognize it. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Which, if you don't recognize that, it's, I don't want a lot for Christmas, there is just one thing I need, and so on. It has the same meter, so we could change them out. Maybe we'll try that next Christmas. However, the next hymn is tied to Hark the Herald Angels Sing, not just because it was written by Wesley, but because Wesley originally believed that Hark the Herald Angels Sing, and our next hymn would be sung to the same tune. Which, knowing that Wesley envisioned a more solemn tune for Hark the Herald Angels Sing, seems even stranger when it is combined with Christ the Lord is Risen Today. Wesley named Hark the Herald Angels Sing a hymn for Christmas morning, and likewise called Christ the Lord is Risen Today a hymn for Easter Day. And then that all just got me thinking, Christ the Lord is risen today, sons of men and nature say. Anyway, this hymn originally had 11 stanzas, which, as an organist and music musician, or a music musician, a music minister in the church, sounds frightening, since we tend to hear about it if we play all four of the verses in our hymnal. Christ the Lord is risen today was written in 1739 after Wesley's conversion. It was first sung in an iron foundry that Wesley converted into a meeting house. The text of this hymn calls to mind many themes of the celebration of Easter. Creation, rejoicing in Christ's resurrection, 
death being vanquished, redemption complete, and now we have new life in Christ. Since we have already discussed a bit of Wesley's past, we will go ahead and sing this hymn as Wesley may have preferred it to a tune that he may have sung it. Slow and solemn. features of the hymn as we sing it today. The original hymn did not contain any of the alleluias at the ends of the lines. These were later added by editors to fit the tune. The alleluias also reflect ancient Jewish and Christian practices and the earliest Easter greeting. Throughout history, this hymn has been set to music by Robert Williams, Henry Carey, and Georg Friedrich Handel, but today it is most commonly sung to an anonymous tune from the Lyrica Davidica, published in 1708, and we are now going to take a listen to this version.
While doing other research on various hymns in preparation for this lecture recital, I was astounded at just how many of them were anonymously written or their authors were unknown, especially the hymns that we know and love. Both Amazing Grace and Christ the Lord is Risen Today are sung to melodies that people who have never set a foot in church would surely recognize. Just thinking of the times I have heard Amazing Grace sung in funeral or memorial services, and to think of the immense comfort that that hymn brings, and to know that we don't know where the music came from amazes me. But that is the beauty of hymnody, and tonight we have barely begun to scratch the surface. The more I thought about this project, and the more that I did work on this project, the more I realized how hymnody can be a callback to the ideals of the early Stone Campbell movement. These three hymns tonight have brought together two authors, at least six composers, and numerous other arrangers, compilers, and editors, and even more arrangers than we had time to discuss tonight. Most of these people do not know one another. They did not have an opportunity to meet one another, but they were all brought together in unity for a brief moment through hymnody. Even further, it brought all of us here together this evening. The early believers in the Stone Campbell movement were calling for unity among the church. Just the stories from this evening show how much more unified we are than perhaps we had thought. 
Our hymnody includes hymns and music from all over the world, from all denominations and faith traditions. Over the past decade that I have been in church music, many of the conversations I have had with congregants all over the United States and abroad about spending their youth in church have included the songs that we used to sing. Even for those who have not returned to church in years, still remember the melodies and words that meant something to them and still mean something to them. Our hymnody tells our story. Not just our church story, but for many of us, our personal stories. It tells where we have come from and where we might be going. There is so much history in our hymnody. It is the part of service that gives us access to our past and our future. Looking through our history from the words of hymns can share so much about what the church and society were going through and how the church responded theologically. An example I came across was after the Civil War when the language of hymnody shifted. Whereas Charles Wesley wrote of hymns calling on the universe to sing praise, later hymnists wrote words that fit more with the private style of prayer. So where do we go from here? I strongly believe that the hymnody that we have as disciples is imperative to our mission for unity in the world. Our hymns do not have denominational boundaries. Each of the hymns sung this evening are not just found in disciples' hymnals, they are found in Methodist hymnals, Episcopal hymnals, Baptist hymnals, Lutheran hymnals, Catholic hymnals, and in many other places as well, not even in church. Our history of hymnody gives us a chance to celebrate the different perspectives of Christianity and the different relationships we have with the divine. But in the end, our hymnody binds us together in unity. Singing the hymns from our past is an important reminder of who we are and who we are still called to be in this world. The hymnody of our past is one of the many pillars that we can cling to when we are away from worship. But that does not mean that we should let our hymnody stagnate and stay the same. Hymnody is constantly changing and should be constantly changing. On average, a church hymnal lasts for about 25 years, and then changes are made due to political climate, world word connotations, or even words falling out of style. Two of my favorite that I came across in my study were The icy chains that bound the earth are now dissolved and gone. Waked by the sun, the blooming spring puts its new livery on. And the other one, But when we thy grand design to save rebellious worms, where justice and compassion join in their divinest form. As disciples, we should be looking forward to ways in which we can create more unity. We don't need any new tools or fancy worship services. We don't need new projectors or a new coffee station in our narthex. We might not have every answer to every question that comes up in our path, but I know there is one answer that creates unity even just for a few minutes. And all we need to do for that is to keep singing. Just think on Easter morning, how many of our siblings are singing, Christ the Lord is risen today around the world. Just that in itself creates some of the unity that our early church leaders were calling for. And with that, I would like to leave you all with one last piece. I wish you God's blessing and the light of the divine to shine on you in this time and in the new year. Thank you all for coming, and I hope to hear you sing together in the future.